This video is to review kinetics. So the next section that we're going to deal with is kinetics. So here we go. I'm going to go over the key parts. Have your guided notes out as we go through or your super notes and fill them in. Uh, first thing is collision theory of reactions. Collision theory basically states that in order for a reaction to occur, particles have to collide. So that's basically what causes chemical reactions as particles collide. Two key components that you need to write down on your sheet are particles have to collide at the right geometry and particles have to collide with enough energy to break the activation energy barrier. That means they're slamming together hard enough so their bonds break. So these are the two key components of a successful collision and that's what basically all chemical reactions are based on. So you want to make sure you copy those two on your uh, super notes. Collision theory, the geometry part of it, the geometry is kind of like this. If chlorine and chlorine slam together, the bond between uh, nitrogen and chlorine is broken, and then you form products of Cl2 and NO. That would basically result in a chemical reaction because when they slam together, the bonds break. If Cl slams in there with oxygen, it is an ineffective collision because the bond basically doesn't break, so ultimately you have no chemical reaction. Now, there's a space for you to copy this down. There are four key factors that affect reaction rates. All four of these you're expected to know on the exam, and they come up every year. Temp concentration is the first one. The greater the concentration means that you will have more collisions, therefore faster rates. So the greater the concentration of molecules when you're doing a chemical reaction automatically means that you will have a more effective collision or a greater chance. Next one is temperature. Temperature. Higher temperature means the particles collide with greater kinetic energy. This is key. So whenever you increase the temperature, you always increase a chemical reaction uh, rate. So ultimately what happens is you increase the rate of reaction because more molecules have greater amount of kinetic energy to break the activation energy barrier. Third, surface area. Increasing surface area means you have greater chances for collision. That's like when you grind something up and the more particles you have, the greater, the greater amount of collisions, those small particles will collide with other particles thus increasing the reaction rate. And finally, catalysts. Catalysts, we know, speed up reactions without being used up from biology. They lower activation energy. So if you lower the amount of energy required to start a chemical reaction, that means um, the chemical reaction will happen at a faster rate. Uh, reaction rates, there's a little space. The average rate of reaction is change in concentration over time. So we do change in concentration over change in time. That's how we do a reaction rate. That's equal to our average reaction rate. I know I gave you a couple definitions on there. These are a couple of the definitions you should be aware of. Average reaction rate is change over a specific time. So whenever we calculate the rate of a reaction, we calculate the change in concentration over something over the change in time. The instantaneous rate of a reaction is a rate of a reaction at a specific second. Instagram is a one picture a picture of one second of your life, instantaneous rate is a, a snapshot of a rate of reaction at a specific time. Initial rate corresponds to at time zero what the rate of the reaction is. Here you see on a graph, you have the same one in your notes. If you notice, one thing they ask fairly frequently on the AP exam is how to find an instantaneous rate. Like at this point at 600 seconds, you run a line tangent to that point. The slope of the line is going to be equal to the reaction rate. So to find an instantaneous rate of reaction, you run a line tangent to any given point, like here at point, uh, time zero, that is equal to the rate of reaction as well. Relative uh, rates, one of the key things you have to realize is we use stoichiometry and kinetics. This, uh, this reactant is being used up at a 0.23 rate. What if I add to compare to how much oxygen I would be using at the same time? Well, the way it works is I would take 0.23, Coefficient here is 1, and it's going to a coefficient of 3, so that would be 3 times, so this would be equal to 0.69. That's how much would be used up. What if I was comparing C2H4 to the amount of CO2 used up? I'm comparing, that's what we talk about, relative rates. Well, what I would do is I would take 0.23, coefficient here is 1, coefficient there is 2, so that would be being produced at a rate of 0.46 molarity, would be double goes back to using the coefficients and then multiplying times the ratio. Here's an example here. What is the instant in time? They say the rate of Br minus is 0.02 times 10 to the negative third. 
BR minus is right there, so I would say 2.0 times 10 to the negative third. That's my rate. They're asking me what would be the value of BR2. Well, the coefficient of BR2 is 3, so it's going from a 5 to a 3. So 3 fifths of 2.0 times 10 to the negative third. Um, this would not be a multiple choice one on the exam um, with those kind of numbers, but you would end up calculating A would be your value. Uh, rate law. Rate law, key thing, comes up a lot. It's an equation that forms a relationship with the rate of a reaction to the concentration of reactants. And you can use catalysts. So this is the form of the differential rate law. Rate is listed on the left-hand side. K is a constant, is a proportionality constant, depending on the type of reaction you're talking about. And then you either have reactants here or you have a catalyst. And the exponents are what we call the order. So when we talk about the order of a reaction with respect to each of these, we're asking you basically what is the exponent. The overall order you get by adding all the exponents together. So if you look right here, here's a rate law A, the coefficient of A, whatever, well not the coefficient, you don't use the coefficients, they would be determined experimentally. So if you determine them experimentally using the sandwich method, you would say that's the order for A, that would be the order for B. C is included in the reaction because catalysts can be in the rate law. So if you do identify a catalyst, know that it can be in the rate law. Here's an example of they give me the rate law right here. This is a rate law. They say, what is the respect, uh, the order with respect to NO? I would say it would be second order. Why? Because the, the exponent is 2, therefore it is a second order reaction. The order with respect to H2 would be first order. And then from that point, I can use the exponents to figure out mathematically like what happens. Like let's say I double NO, I use the exponent, and it tells me what happens to the rate. I just basically do the math using the exponent. How do we get the exponents? That's what we call rate law. I call it standing style. Remember, you're going to double stack a rate law. You always put the bigger one on top. You're going to make two sandwiches. The rate law problem always has three parts to it. The first thing is you make two sandwiches. Second thing is you have to find K. Third thing is you do a what if. So if we look, let's take a look. Here's like a sandwich problem. You have a sample that you're going to complete yourself. The first thing I do is I look for a reaction where one of the reactants is held constant. You have to have at least one of them held constant the first time in order to solve it. If you notice here, it's 0 0.005, 0 0.005. Those things are held constant. Therefore, I can basically cancel the CL. When I go to find my top and bottom bun, I look at my rates. Whatever one is larger would go on the top. Whatever one is smaller would, go on my, would become my bottom bun. So then I would stack it like this. I would go 3.64 times 10 to the negative 12 over 1.82 times 10 to the negative 12 equals, and then I take the two values. I don't know what the exponent is, so I'm going to go 0 0.002 to the m and 0 0.0010 to the m. This simplifies the two. This simplifies the two. Therefore, my order with respect to m would be first order. So I would say H2, I just figured out as first order, I would set it up like that. I would do the same thing and solve for Cl2. Because in this case, if you look, they actually held H2 constant. Even if they didn't, I could plug it in and do the math. Second thing they have is they always have you find the rate units of the rate constant. And then when they have you find K, let's say hypothetically, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I'm just going to write a fake rate law just to show you. Let's say it's H2 to the first and Cl2 to the first. Once I discover the exponents, here's how I find K. I take the values from the first uh, experiment. You can take it pretty much from any of them. And I plug it in. I plug in right there. Plug in the molarity for Cl2, the molarity for H2. Pop it all in. I algebraically solve for K. The last part, they always ask you, what if? What if is once you have K and the exponents, then you have an active rate law. Then I can take molarities that I'm given, drop them in here, and calculate out the reaction rate. That's the overall purpose for the differential rate law. All right, um, this is out of sequence. Key thing to remember, units of K. This is the trick. You definitely want to write this down to figure out units of K really quickly. I definitely will ask you this tomorrow. All you do is you take molarity is 1 minus the overall order of the reaction, and then T minus 1. That's the trick. So if I found my last sample one I said was second order, my units for K would be M1 minus 2, because it's second order, t minus 1, although in the data table it says seconds, so therefore I could say seconds minus 1. All right. Um, 
Reaction mechanisms. What is a reaction mechanism problem? That's a problem where they give you slow, fast reactions. The first step in a reaction mechanism problem, you have to copy these down, is you cancel the intermediates. Second step is you total the overall reaction. Third step is you write the rate law based on the slowest step. The slowest step is always considered the rate determining step, so that's what's going to give you your rate law. And this is the only time in kinetics you can use the coefficients. And then if there are any intermediates in the rate law, you have to sub in using the reactants above. Reactants above, that's key. So you grab the reactants above, sub in, and you're good to go. So here's an example of a rate law problem. Let me see here. This is out of order. I look right here. So if I go here, I'm going to cancel intermediates. If I notice Cl2, ClO2, F2, ClOF2, F, and F cancels, everything else does not cancel. These are intermediates because they're not in the uh, reactants at the start and they're not in the products at the end and they cancel upward. Remember, intermediates cancel upward like this, cancels upward from left to right. So that would be an intermediate. So it asked me to identify the intermediates. I would say Cl2, F2, and F would be my two intermediates. My overall reaction, I group like terms, so I say 2ClO2 plus F2 arrow 2ClO2F. That's what I would do. Then I write my rate law based on the slowest step. That's where you got to remember, I basically focus on my reactants to the slowest step, and I write out my rate law. My rate law would be rate is equal to K concentration of ClO2 F2, and then... The coefficient is the only time I can use coefficients would be to the first power. The only problem is I'm not allowed to have intermediates in my rate law. Technically, that's an intermediate. So what I do is I sub in, I go to the reactants above, take the whole thing, and I plug that in instead. So ClO2 and concentration of F2, and there is my overall rate law. Rate is equal to K, ClO to the first, F2 to the first. That's how I do an intermediate or reaction mechanism problem. I talked to you about a catalyst. Here's how a catalyst looks. Actually, no, I don't think I have one. I thought I had a catalyst problem in there. Um, we just did a bunch of differential rate law problems. We did differential rate law, so it talks about how rate changes the concentration. You're able to give it a specific exponent, and then you can do what if. The only other thing they use very slightly is the integrated rate law. That focuses on how concentration changes with time. So if I look here, this is basically my integrated rate law right there. So it's natural log. It's the concentration of T over a concentration of zero. This is at time zero, so this is my initial value. This is at some other time, the leftovers, basically. And then K is my constant, and T is the amount of time, and time always has to match my rate constant. So if I look right there, that matches my rate constant. All right. Another key thing is you have to be able to find um, the a reaction order by a straight line plot. What does that mean? Well, if you take data and you graph it, which ultimately you need to copy this down in your notes, is a zero-order plot, if it's a zero-order reaction, only has a reactant on the Y. So you can tell basically what the order of a reaction is based on its straight line plot. So if I have A listed on this side, basically my slope of my reaction is equal to negative K and I know it's a zero order. If I have log or natural log of A on my y-axis, I'm going to get a straight line that looks like that. My slope is equal to K. It is a first order reaction. Finally, if I have the inverse and I get a straight line plot, my slope is equal to K, and I will know it is a second order reaction. So if I look right here, I have a set of data. Ultimately, what they'll do on the exam is they'll present you with a bunch of graphs, and you have to identify the order based on the data. So I plot the first date I do. A zero order plot would have A on the Y axis. And if you notice, it doesn't give me a straight line, so it can't be first order or second zero order. This is natural log on the Y. Doesn't give me a straight line plot. Finally, uh, inverse versus time, I get a straight line plot. Therefore, I know the reaction has to be second order. So it is a second order reaction. K is equal to the slope of the line. Key thing right there. Now. If I look here, here's an example of what they do on the AP exam. They present me with three graphs. I have to identify which of the graphs gives me a straight line plot. And if I notice it's cut off, it has ethanol or the reactants listed here. 
That's how I know it is a zero order reaction. So I know it's a zero order reaction because this, if it was this one, this would be a second order reaction. This would be a first order reaction if it was a straight line plot. So overall, my rate law would be rate is equal to K because it's zero order. Then I would have to find the units and things like that. And later on, we'll talk about that more in class. Here's another example of data. If I notice, the first thing I notice is I have a straight line plot and my data is a natural log of X. That means I know it is a first order reaction based on a straight line plot. Here's another example. We'll skip through that. Uh, last thing I want to tell you is this. You have this graph at the bottom of your notes. This is important to remember. This proves that why, if you increase temperature, reaction rate increases. Okay? Because what happens is when you increase temperature, you have more greater average kinetic energy of the particles. They gain more kinetic energy, which means more of the collisions will be effective. So if you take a look at like temperature one, which is a lower temperature right there. Temperature one, you have a certain amount of actually temperature, yeah, temperature one it has a certain amount of molecules, a little shaded area right here, has enough. This represents the EA here, represents the activation energy. So only a certain amount of molecules have enough energy to break the activation energy and form a or do a reaction when they react. If you increase the temperature, like T2 is an increase in temperature, so as temperature increases, what happens to my amount of molecules, kinetic energy? They spread out wider, but what also happens is this side of the tail increases. So more molecules have greater amount of kinetic energy to break the activation energy. So this graph proves that if you increase temperature, you will always increase reaction rates. So that's what you definitely want to have as a takeaway. Last thing really quick is if you're going to do half-life, remember half-life, there's a little half-life shortcut for you to fill out. 100 to 50, 50 to 25, 25 to 12.5, and then finally 12.5 to 6.25. Here's how it works. One half-life, going from 50 to 25 is the second half-life, third half-life, and then finally a fourth half-life. When you have to do a half-life problem, they ask you how many half-lives, they talk about the percent remaining. This is equal to the percent remaining. So when you fill it out, basically, like if I told you there was two half-lives, after two half-lives, how much is left? 25. After three half-lives, how much is left? 12.5, or 87.5% of it has reacted. So it's an easy, quick way to figure out half-lives and the amount remaining. So fill that out in your little grid. That's the notes. Take your Kung Fu quiz, and I definitely will give you a video quiz tomorrow. Because you know what time it is? Hold on. I'll tell you what time it is. It is a little lunch time. Word.